Continuing the fundamental health series, we're dealing with a message today inside the series called The Roots of Redemption. Now, Proverbs 25, 2, we dealt with that last week. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, to hide a matter. But is the glory of kings to search a matter out or to dig it up? The proverb is telling us that occasionally God will hide things to see if you want to chase after him and love him enough to dig it up and find out what it is. Genesis is the root system of your entire Bible. Genesis, therefore, is the root system, and all of the Old Testament, is the root system of Christianity. Christianity is the natural outgrowth of Judaism that we see in the Old Testament. When Adam and Eve fell into sin in the garden and all of mankind fell with them into sin, not only did God decide of his own will and volition and love to redeem them, but God also looked forward into time at their lives, at their descendants, at their everyday circumstances and situations. And God decided to hide the story of his plan of redemption in the ground of their everyday lives. God used the things that they went through in the Old Testament to whisper about a savior that was coming in the New Testament. So the Old Testament is Jesus Christ concealed. Jesus Christ hidden in the field of the Old Testament and the characters and the circumstances that went on. The New Testament is Jesus Christ revealed in the glorious light and clarity of the gospel, where the Old Testament uses metaphor, allegory, shadow, and type to reveal Christ. The New Testament reveals Christ in his radiance. So this brings up an important question a lot of Bible students ask. When we read Genesis, is Genesis to be taken literal or metaphorical? And the answer is both. The word of God is true and can be trusted as historical fact but it's also layered enough to give us teaching tools about Christ through metaphor, shadow, and type. God in his goodness, so good at being God, used the real life scenarios of these real people that really existed and yet planted the seed of his redemptive story and promise in their lives. So the Old Testament tells both. Yes, it is history, and yes, it is narrative. But at the same time, when we today look back at it, it offers us pictures of Jesus all the way through. And you know what this means. This means God himself was preaching about Jesus thousands of years before Mary ever got pregnant. God was preaching about Jesus, and he planted the roots of redemption underground in the Old Testament. When, when God told Father Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, and sacrifice him on the mountain, God was preaching about Jesus. When the angel stopped Abraham's hand coming down with the knife and said, Abraham, stop, look over your shoulder. There's a substitute. There's a ram tied in a thicket of thorns by his head. God was preaching about Jesus. When Jacob wrestled with an angel all night that changed his name and even his character, God was preaching about Jesus. When Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit, and eventually forgotten in a prison, God was preaching about Jesus. When Joseph was taken up out of the prison, and he rose all the way to the right hand of the king on high, and he began to save and forgive and provide for his own brothers who betrayed him, God was simply preaching about Jesus. And that's just Genesis. Step over into Exodus. Every Passover lamb that was offered, God was preaching about 
about Jesus. The rock that was struck by the rod of Moses that offered life-giving water to the people in the wilderness. God was preaching about Jesus. When the manna bread started falling down out of heaven to quench the hunger of their bodies, it was God preaching about Jesus. The Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle of Moses was God preaching about Jesus. We step over into Joshua, the scarlet cord thrown out of the window of the harlot Rahab that ended up saving her entire house was nothing more than God simply preaching about Jesus. All through your Old Testament from Samson's jawbone to the stone that David threw that knocked Goliath down, it was nothing more than God using the circumstances to preach about a coming Savior, a coming Messiah, a coming Redeemer. And he's been saving us from the beginning. He's been talking about it from the beginning. From the beginning, he had this on his mind. But in Genesis chapter 4, if, you know, if you've ever listened to preaching for a consistent amount of time, the thing about preaching, when you get to know it and you get used to it, uh, you have some sermons that you like more than others. You have some sermons that stand out. Oh, not you, Pastor. Every sermon is my favorite sermon. No, you have, you have some sermons that stand out, you know, more than others. And in my opinion, Genesis chapter 4 is God's ultimate message. His ultimate standout performance of preaching and revealing his plan of redemption. And he did it inside of a family feud. A conflict between two brothers. He packed so much revelation about his plan of redemption in this one story, it is staggering to the mind. The chapter before, Genesis chapter 3, is when mankind had fallen into sin. God comes and he begins the process of restoring Adam and Eve. Their sin had created a breach between mankind and God. Sin did then what sin does now. Sin separates. And in response to the separation, God took on the responsibility of repairing the relationship. God killed two animals and then covered Adam and Eve in the skins of the animals that he killed. Notice, Adam didn't come to God in repentance saying, God, I messed up. I need you to help me. God went looking for Adam. Adam, where art thou? And then God did not let Adam get involved in the sacrifice. God told Adam and Eve to stand aside, and God handled the sacrifice himself, raising up this first principle of our redemption, that salvation has nothing to do with you. Salvation belongs to God and to God alone. You did not save yourself, and you cannot save yourself. If there's any saving to be done, it belongs to God alone. Second principle that it raises up in our theology, the root system grows out into Christianity in fruit form, but all the way down in the root, God killed animals to cover Adam and Eve. It raises up the issue for the first time, and it's a doctrinal point, that without the shedding of innocent blood, there is no remission for sin. God is revealing that it would require innocent blood to restore the relationship between fallen humanity and Father God. So God took all of the responsibility and God started the process and he restored them by the blood of a lamb and then taught them that they might teach their children and those coming after them. Baby, when you approach God, you don't bring your own efforts. You don't bring your own strength. You don't bring religious ceremony. You have to bring innocent blood if you want to approach God, not by morals, not by works, lest anyone should boast. If you want to approach God, you have to have innocent blood. God taught them this so that they would know and the generations coming after them would know that they were receiving a forgiveness that they did not deserve and a grace that they did not qualify for. Because the moment you think you qualify for God's grace, you have just been locked out of it. The moment you think that something you have done qualifies you to be God's favorite, you've just 
locked yourself out of it. The principle was you have to bring a substitutionary sacrifice, something to die in your place because you sinned, you did wrong, you deserve death. But if you have a substitutionary sheep, you can sacrifice that and it can die in your place. And he wanted this principle to be firmly rooted in their mind. So in Genesis 4, verse 3, the scripture says, in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the scripture says the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Now, this wasn't random. These two boys were going to worship. They had been taught by their parents what to bring. Okay. Uh, the scripture says in the book of Hebrews that by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. How does faith come? By hearing the word of the Lord. That means Abel would have had to heard a word from God in order to have faith towards what to bring. So Abel is following the instruction, the instruction and bringing God what he asked for. Cain, on the other hand, is bringing God what he thinks God ought to be happy with. And Cain should have known if it took blood to redeem mama and daddy, if it took blood to redeem Abel, it's going to take blood to redeem you. There is no such thing as corporate salvation. Everybody in the house isn't saved just because you're saved. Each person has to come into contact with the blood of the lamb in order for salvation to be applied. And in the shadows, we just read it and, it, and it's hidden. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing. It's a glory of God to conceal a thing. It's hidden there. But in Genesis 4, on the bookends, so the beginning of the chapter and the end of the chapter, we see a beautiful hidden picture of Jesus Christ. Because Genesis chapter 4 starts with the death of a lamb, the sheep that Abel brought. Genesis 4 ends with the death of a son. Abel died. Cain killed him. And for the first time in scripture, we see in the same chapter, a lamb and a man, and they're both bleeding. It's a prophetic foretelling that the redemptive lamb of God was never a sheep in the first place. The redemptive lamb of God was Jesus Christ, the son that was murdered by his own, but whose blood offers us redemption and forgiveness. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing. Abel pleased God because he did not offer something he worked to produce. When it comes to salvation, your works can never produce it. Abel was not responsible for creating the lamb. Abel was not responsible for creating the blood. Abel is bringing God an offering by faith. He's bringing God innocent blood by faith. Cain, on the other hand, is bringing God something that he planted, harvested, and worked for. Cain here represents religion, self-righteousness, self-works. Seeking to redeem yourself and find good standing in God by how hard you try, by how good you try to be, by how uh, you know, modest you dress, and by how uh, all the behavior modification that you do, and thinking that those things are what save you. And it draws a stark contrast between the two. Religion says, I am saved because I Works righteousness, self-righteousness always says, I am saved because I. Grace says, I am saved because he. Yeah. Abel understands salvation belongs to God. Say that with me. Salvation belongs to God. So Abel offers a lamb and God accepts it and he blesses him. The word, the Hebrew word there, the scripture said God had respect. The Hebrew word for respect there, interesting words, first time it's used in scripture is seah. 
Say it. Say ah. It means to spare, to bless, and to turn around. Now, this is first mention of blood being offered to God. This is first mention of somebody bringing an offering of blood atonement to God. The first one God did himself. This is first mention of someone coming into contact by faith in the blood. This is the first mention. And so what that means is whenever you come into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ, what God did the first time he's still doing today. When you come into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ by faith, God will spare you. I don't care what you've done, what you're guilty of, how much judgment you deserve. When you come into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ, God will spare you. There's some people in this room that know for a fact what I'm talking about because there's a whole lot of issues and circumstances in your life where you know you should have been God, but God God spared you because you came into contact with the blood of Jesus by faith. Some of us should be in the hospital this morning. Some of us should be in the graveyard. Some of us never should have made it this long, but we came in contact with the blood of Jesus by faith and God spared us. But then the second thing it says, God blessed him. Not only did God spare him and grant salvation to his life, but because he brought blood, God decided because you brought what I asked for and you did it the right way, I am going to bless you. I'm not just going to save you. I am going to bless you. Christianity would be amazing if the only promise was just salvation, but we don't just have the promise of salvation. We have the promise of the blessing and favor of God over our lives when we approach him by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's a blessing in the blood of Jesus. Don't you ever doubt it. There's a blessing in the blood of Jesus. And then he said, number three, say, uh, I'll turn your life around. See, you can be saved and still crazy in your mind. You can be saved and still have some bad habits. You can be saved and still have some bad attachments. You can be saved and still have some bad connections. You can be saved and still have some bad mindsets about spending money. You can be saved but still have all kind of issues. And God said, not only, hallelujah, not only will I save you and not only will I spare you and not only will I bless you, but I will refuse to leave you in the broken condition that you are in. Once you come into contact with the blood, I'll start turning things in your life around. I'll start turning your mindset around. I'll start turning your thinking around. I'll start turning ghetto mentalities around and take them out of your mind. I'll start turning things that you learned wrong. Things that people who should have taught you better, they taught you worse. And you were little and you absorbed certain things and certain behaviors and certain mindsets and certain personality traits. But God said, when you come into contact with the blood, I will not leave you in that condition. I'll spend as much time as it takes to turn you all the way around. Abel got all of that off the blood of a, of a lamb. All of that off the blood of a lamb. And notice God wasn't saying, I'm going to partner with you to bless you. I'm going to partner with you to spare you. I'm going to partner with you to turn your life around. God said, I'm going to do it now by the blood. In other words, the blood, hallelujah, was enough. It was enough for Abel, and it is enough for you. Whatever twisted, broken problems are going on in your life this morning, the answer is not some psycho babble meditation, some self help, self improvement. The answer is what it always was. The answer is found in what God does when you approach him through the blood of Jesus Christ. So he had respect for Abel and his offering. He did not have respect for Cain. So Abel standing there blessed by God. I mean, just blessed by the blood. 
Cain's standing there, not blessed. And we see back then something we still see today, that not blessed people are quick to hate on blessed people. And Cain began to burn with anger and hatred over the blessing that God gave Abel. Abel was standing there and he was hated, but he was still blessed because he found out the hatred of men cannot stop the favor of God over your life when you come by the blood. I'm going to say that again. The hatred of men, the plots of men, the plans of men, the lies of men cannot stop the favor and blessing of God over your life when you come to God by the blood. He's blessed. He's blessed anyway. That's been my testimony all my life. I'm blessed anyway. Got some issues, but I'm blessed anyway. Have some people that really don't like me, but I am blessed anyway. In fact, I bet you if you look over your life, you'll have the same testimony. I've been blessed anyway. Not that I haven't had any problems, but I'm so blessed. None of them been able to take me out. Look at you, all the things you've been through. Nothing to this point has been able to take you out. I'm blessed. But the problem, the problem with the blessing of God is it attracts the hatred of those around you. So Abel's blessing attracted Cain's hate, and Cain just began to burn with hatred. He began to boil with hatred to the point that he invited his brother Abel into his field and he rose up against him, and he murdered his brother. Verse 8, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field. Everybody say the field. There's that field again. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Now, remember, the field was where Cain worked. Remember, he was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. So Abel, his brother, came into Cain's field. Another hidden, buried picture of Jesus. Abel left where he was and went down into Cain's field. Just like Jesus left where he was and came down into the field of the earth. John said he came unto his own. He came unto his own brothers. He came unto his own kindred. He came unto his own. But instead of receiving him, his own began to hate him when he started walking in the field. And the same demonic spirit of jealousy and anger and rage and murder that got on Cain, that same spirit got on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they decided they didn't want to accept their brother. They wanted to kill their brother. And they didn't just kill Jesus. They took him to the judgment hall first and ripped the beard out of his face till blood began to run down his cheeks. Then they took him to the whipping post and flogged him 39 times, causing great lacerations in his body, causing the blood to pour down. And then, if that wasn't enough, they hung him on a cross, nailed his hands and his feet, twisted a crown of thorns on his head, and the blood began to gush when they lifted him off the earth and hung him high in the air on a cross. And all of the blood he had left just began to empty out, pouring out on the ground ground in the field in the field and when they did and when this natural world and the spirit world saw Jesus empty out his blood in the field hell started to celebrate the demise of another son the son of God but if they would have known that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Oh, that's prettier preaching than the way you're receiving. It's the glory of God to hide a thing. 
and see who has the wisdom of kings to go dig the thing up. If they would have known it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, it's the honor of kings to search a matter out. If the devil would have just read the rest of Genesis chapter 4, the devil himself would never have allowed one drop of Jesus' blood to be spilled. Because the Bible says Cain killed Abel and got rid of the body. But God said, Cain, I hear the voice of your brother's blood screaming up to me from the ground. Cain hid the body, but he couldn't silence the voice of the blood. Raising another important New Testament doctrine, which has its roots all the way in Genesis chapter 4, that blood has a voice God can hear. Yeah, yeah. So Abel, Abel's blood was saying, God, he killed me. God, don't let him tell my mama I ran away. God, don't let him tell my daddy I quit on the family. God, don't let him tell my wife and kids I abandoned them. He killed me. He killed me, God. God, God, answer me. God, he killed me. God, I demand justice. And the blood wouldn't shut up until God got down off his throne, came down to the field it was spilled in, and started inspecting what the blood was saying. God went and tracked down Cain, said, where's your brother boy? Am I my brother's keeper? Don't lie to me. I know what you did because the blood told me so. Now, Hebrews tells us that Jesus' blood can talk just like Abel's. Except Hebrew said, Jesus' blood speaks better things. Because in the same way Abel's blood screamed for justice, Jesus' blood screams in the ears of God for mercy. Every time you sin and the accuser of the brethren stands before God, the judge to accuse you while he's making his opening argument, God can't even hear what he's saying because there's a shrill screeching sound of screaming blood in his ears. And it's the blood that Jesus Christ poured out in the field of the earth. And Jesus is saying, God, no matter what they've done, God, no matter where they've been, God, no matter how they lied, God, no matter how they cheated, God, no matter how they conned, no matter how they slipped around, no matter what they did, God, I'm crying out to you to have mercy on them. I know they're guilty, but my blood was shed. They've professed faith in my blood. They've approached you by my blood. God, remember my sacrifice. God, remember the stripes on my back. God, remember the spear in my side. God, remember the nails in my hands. God! And it's a shame after all he did. He still has to work so hard for us. But the only reason you're not standing in judgment this morning is because the last time you sinned, whether it was last night or on your way to church, the blood got up and started talking in God's ears again. When you broke your promises, when you lusted, when you lied, when you fornicated, when you committed adultery, when you had that abortion, when you did whatever you have done, though you were guilty, a loud screaming sound came into the ears of Almighty God and said, God, I demand mercy. 
It's, it's the mercy. And somehow we're living in a generation that has forgotten it. It is the mercy that has covered you. It is the mercy that has secured you. It is the mercy that allows you to stand. And you will never grow in the church, mature in the things of God, past the point that you need the mercy that comes from applying the blood of Jesus Christ to your heart by faith. And wherever that blood is applied, to whomever it is applied on, it screams for. It screams for. It's screaming for you today. And when you fall a week from now or a month from now or a year from now, and you're overwhelmed with guilt and feel that you cannot get up, when you disappoint your own self, when you violate your own principles and feel like you cannot move forward, the blood is still saying, I demand mercy. Why wouldn't we praise a God like that? Why wouldn't we worship a God like that? Why wouldn't we stand in awe of a God? And once again, God just keeps on pouring out. Because not only did the blood cry out in God's ears, Abel's blood cried out and said, I gotta have justice. Go track him down. I gotta have justice. God said to Cain, The, uh, the field is never going to produce anything for you again. You can plant seeds, but you won't ever get a harvest. You won't ever get a crop. You won't ever have a return. No fruit's going to come to you out of the field ever again. Because Abel's blood got down in that field. The enemy is a farmer and your soul is like soil. And the enemy starts when you're young, when you're little, trying to plant generational curses in the ground of your life. Tries to plant things that will destroy your family 15 years from now in the ground of your life. He tries to plant memories and abuses and traumas and difficulties and broken mindsets. He tries to plant it in your heart. As long as you live, the enemy will be trying to sow negative seeds into the ground of your life, into the field of your life. But just like God told Cain, you ain't never going to be able to sow anything in that field again because of the blood. God tells Christians that once the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to your life, to your heart, once that blood gets in your field, no weapon from the enemy will ever be able to prosper. No generational curse will ever be able to grow up out of you again. Nothing the enemy tried to sow in your childhood can come forth. All of it has to be broken and aborted because the blood got in in the field in the field in the field in the field. Some of you got some stuff going on right now. You need to get the blood on the field. You got some things in your life right now. You need to get the blood on the field. And that brings me to what Matthew said. He talked about a treasure hidden in a field. And he talked about a pearl of great price. It's my personal belief these two things are one in the same. I believe God hid the treasure that is the pearl of great price, the gospel. And I believe he hid it in the field of the Old Testament. And then he sold all he had. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He sold all he had to buy the field. And then he presented the Old Testament field to the church and said, learn Jesus, learn redemption, learn salvation, learn the fundamentals so that you can have health 
in your life. Learn the fundamentals so you can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Learn the fundamentals so that you don't have to repeat the story of your grandmother and your mother. Learn the fundamentals so you don't have to be bogged down by the same generational curses as your father and your grandfather and your uncles. Learn the fundamentals. Learn the power of the blood and begin to have faith in it. Understand the mechanics of what's happening in heaven when you get saved. You know, it's a dichotomy. Different things happening. You get saved on earth, you might get saved in a really nice church or a really ugly church. You might get saved to some beautiful music or some really bad music. You might get saved under some really hot anointed preaching. Or you might get saved. The preaching was so bad, God just gave the preacher grace to say one thing that pricked your heart with conviction. The the conditions vary widely about what happens on earth during the moment of salvation. Sometimes you're crying at an altar. Sometimes you're sitting in your seat. Or sometimes you go through the whole service and then get in your car and break down on the way home and have an encounter with God. The conditions vary wildly. But what happens in heaven when you get saved is very simple. The blood starts screaming for you. The blood starts crying out mercy over you. The blood speaks your name into the register of heaven. You remember my text to those registered in heaven. Who registered me? The blood that spoke my name and cried mercy over my life. I pray you wouldn't go one day without waking up saying, I plead the blood of Jesus over my life. I plead the blood of Jesus over my house. I plead the blood of Jesus over my past. I plead the blood of Jesus over my present, and I plead the blood of Jesus over my future. I plead the blood of Jesus over my children. God, give them an encounter with you. I plead the blood of Jesus over my family members. God, let them know you in your truth and your glory. I plead the blood of Jesus over my finances. I plead the blood of Jesus over any debt that I may have. I plead the blood of Jesus over any sin that's in my life. I plead the blood of Jesus over any curses that I've partnered with willingly. I plead the blood of Jesus and begin to have faith in the blood that was shed. It's why we need to be taught about it because when we're taught about it, we can believe for it. And when we can believe for it, we can receive it in our lives. The blood, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, if you have confessed with your mouth that you believe in your heart, he died for your sins and was risen on the third day by the power of the glorious Father. If you believe that fundamental truth, then the blood is speaking for you. The blood is speaking for you. The blood is speaking for you. I don't want to offend you, but it's speaking for you before you repent. You didn't hear me. It's speaking for you before you repent. Repent. The scripture said his mercy is new every morning. Whose mercy? The blood's. He never shuts up. He never gets quiet, never takes a day off, never stops speaking, never stops screaming, never starts talking to God the judge about how worthy you are to be saved, about how righteous you are to be redeemed. Standing there with your guilty self, your broken self, your lying self, your drug addicted self, your abusive self, your broken self, that he would speak for me. If it's not grace, there's There's nothing that can better explain it. And for some of you, he's been speaking for you for a long time. 
speaking for you through that abortion, speaking for you through that affair, speaking for you through that violence you did to those people, speaking for you through the theft you committed, speaking for you at the lowest, filthiest, dirtiest moments of your life when nobody you know would stand up and speak for you. There was one voice. Oh, I said there was one voice. There was one voice. When you went for months without uttering one praise to him, there was one voice that was always saying something about you. When you went for months and you didn't come and you didn't worship him, there was one voice that was crying out for you. The voice of the blood of Jesus is so powerful. It's why Paul wrote in Corinthians that if the devil would have known what God was doing, if the devil would have had the glory to search out the matter hidden by the master, have never allowed it to happen but when his blood got out I said when his blood got out when his blood poured out it started talking that day and it has never stopped I said it started talking that day and it has never I want to talk to broken people I want to talk to people that got a mess going on in your life. I want to talk to people that need salvation. Or maybe you're saved, you just need to be cleansed. You're saved, you just need to have your mind washed of all the mess that you've been through. You're like Abel before God blessed him. He was saved, but he was still twisted and needed to be turned around. I want to talk to people who want to encounter the blood of Jesus by faith. I want to talk to people that are sick in your body. I want to talk to people that are sick in your home. There's something wounded. There's something broken. There's something not like it's supposed to be. As you stand to your feet all over this auditorium, I want to challenge you. If you need to come into contact with God, you do it by faith, confessing with your mouth and believing with your heart. And if you need prayer, if you need help doing that, our elders are coming right now, and you can come to this altar just as soon as you possibly can, and we will pray with you and ask God to touch you in a special way today. In Jesus' name, if you need to come, come. If you need to come, come. If you need a touch, come. If you need prayer for anything, come. If you need to find an altar and make something right with God, come. If you need to come and lay something down, make a turn, make a change in your life, come. Whatever it is, wherever the need is, if you need it,
Come on, lift up your hand. Lord Jesus, I believe you are my Savior. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose on the third day to save me and justify me. Lord, I plead the blood that you shed over my life from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. God, I need the blood to speak for me. Lead me and guide me. Strengthen me and give me confidence in the blood of Jesus. No matter what happens, I am confident in the blood. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a praise all over the house. May the Lord, your God, that saved you, may that God also bless you. May that God also turn your life around. May that God give you peace regardless of whatever you're facing in your personal life today. May the God of all peace grant you peace. May the God of all hope grant you peace. May the God of all strength grant you peace. In Jesus' mighty name, may you be confident, firmly rooted and grounded in who you are in God and how God sees you because of the blood of Jesus. God bless you. If you want to sow a seed into the kingdom of God, today would be a great day to do it. If you have an offering or if you got here late and you didn't get your tithe together, you can come and bring that or you can get out your phone and you can text to give. A lot of people have been using text to give. It's very convenient. If you want to do that, we encourage it. May the blessing of the Lord go home with you today.